Literature adds to reality. It does not simply describe it. It enriches the necessary competencies that daily life requires and provides. And in this respect, it irrigates the deserts that our lives have already become. I am Neeraj Fizar, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Shulini University. And I welcome you again to another session of our Literature Festival. The session now is Meet the Author. And to moderate the session, may I have a privilege to introduce you to our moderator, Professor Manju Jadka. Professor Manju Jadka has been teaching English since 1974. She has served as a professor at Punjab University Chandigarh. She has held several administrative responsibilities at the university and also with the Chandigarh administration. She has authored many books. Professor Jadka has received many awards and distinctions, including award for lifetime contribution to literature from Chandigarh Sahitya Academy. She is currently head Department of English Shulini University. Without much ado, over to you, Professor Jadka. Thank you, Neeraj. Welcome, Geeta. It's so good to see you again. And, and for the audience, I begin with a teaser. How many faces does the day have? How many faces does the day have? And the night? How many faces does the night have? Is it just one monolithic mass of blackness that separates the light, that replaces the light of the day? An opaque wall that none can penetrate? A blind alley leading to nowhere? The night? in my opinion and yours too, would be little more than a faceless pall of darkness. But ask Gita, ask Gita Hariharan, and she will tell you that the night has a thousand faces. She will tell you that the night is peopled by the ghosts of Vatsu Master, by undercover hidden people living in times of siege, by the spirits of Shehrzad and Duniazad and other characters of 1001 Arabian Nights. The night has a thousand faces that Gita Hariharan can see and describe. And so does the river. The river too has a thousand faces. What you see and what I see is just a reflection of what lies within you and me. I'd like to read a short para. The river the river, it has spread itself wide, wider, as if it has permission to go anywhere it likes, and it has no idea how to stand still. It trembles, ripples, it draws straight lines like arrows, it draws circles that get smaller and smaller and grow large again. It flows, sways, it reflects sky, tree, hills, bird, boat, even itself. Can a body have so many faces? Can a body have so many faces? Will all his life be enough to meet them and get to know them? The river swims into view just about. The mist takes a long horizontal bar of thin smoke above the river. Then it dissipates. The river reveals itself like a photograph being developed, emerging gently out of the darkness trying on its daytime appearance. This is the river. How many faces does it have? And how many faces does Gita Hariharan have? Writer, mother, activist, humanist, idealist? One who feels for the downtrodden, the marginalized, the underprivileged. One who hopes for a utopia, an anandagram where there are no highs and no lows, no dis distinction of caste or creed. But getting down to the facts and figures governing the life of an author, let me give you a brief trajectory of Gita's life for everyone here would like to know something about the person behind the work. So this is about Gita's background. Gita was born in Coimbatore and she grew up in Bombay and Manila. She was educated in these two cities and later in the United States. She got a Bachelor of Arts, Honours Degree in English Literature and Psychology from Bombay. 
and a Master of Arts in Communication from Connecticut. She has worked in New York. She has been an editor in Mumbai and New Delhi with Orient Longman. She has been a freelance professional editor for a range of academic institutions and foundations. And she is at present a writer based in New Delhi. In 1995, and this is remarkable, in 1995, Gita challenged the Hindu Minority and Guardianship Act as discriminatory against women. We'd love to hear you talk about that, Gita, in addition to your books. The case, Gita Hariharan and another versus Reserve Bank of India and another, led to a Supreme Court judgment in 1999 on guardianship. This was groundbreaking. Gita's published work includes novels, short stories, essays, newspaper articles, and columns. Her first novel was The Night the Thousand Faces of Night. And this got her the Commonwealth Writers Prize. And then there are other books like The Ghosts of Basu Master, Dream, When Dreams Travel, that is I think about my favorite, When Dreams Travel, In Times of Siege, Fugitive Histories, and the latest is I Have Become the Tide. I Have Become the Tide. That is where I read you those two paragraphs from. There is also a collection of short stories, The Art of Dying. and collection of essays, Almost Home. She has edited stories, she has translated, and she's also written for children. Sorry, best friend, this is for children. And uh, co-edited a collection called Battling for India, a citizen's reader. Her work has been translated into many languages, including French, Italian, Spanish, German, Dutch, Greek, Urdu, Vietnamese. Her essays and fiction have been included in anthologies like Salman Rushdie's Mirror Work, 50 Years of Indian Writing, 1947 to 1997. And I remember that is the time when I first heard of Gita Hariran's name when the collection came out. It was uh, uh, 50 years after independence and uh, the feeling was that we do not really have an anthology that brings together the works of uh, Indian writers in English. Uh, Salman Rushdie got a lot of flack for it because of his selection, but Gita's work stood out, even though uh, it was spelled in three different ways in the book, her name. Mm -hmm. uh, right, I know because I was asked to review it and I pointed it out, huh? but otherwise that was the first time I encountered Gita and well, since then, every time I pick up a book and I remember once I was reading one of her books and I just had to message her. I said, Gita, I'm just reading your book and my God, if you, you know, you just, I'm, I'm blown, blown away completely. I remember doing that once. And uh, well, she has been a visiting professor, writer in residence in several universities, including Dartmouth, which is very prestigious, Ivy League, George Washington University, University of um, Canterbury in UK, and so on. And she's one of the founders of the Indian Writers Forum, which is a platform for cultural politics and a consulting editor to the forum's journal of culture, which is called Gupta Goo. I must also tell you that Gita has been praised by a lot of people like John Kutsi, J.M. Kutsi, Nantara Segal, Michael Ondaatje, and well, what more could a writer wish for? So here is Gita Hariharan for you. Gita, welcome, and we are so happy to see you here. I know you had a trying 24 hour period uh, behind you, but I'm happy that you managed to join us today. Yes, Gita. Thank you so much. I must, in the interests of accuracy, I must point out that it's not a trying 24 hours. It's close to a trying 100 hours. And oh dear. Um, ongoing. It's wonderful to be able to speak to somebody else since I can't leave the house. Um, anyway, I uh, thank you. I have to say that uh, so much praise is making me feel I will never recognize myself again. Uh, but I do want to pick up on something you spoke about, Manju, which is uh, multiplicity, that um, the, the numbers, um, uh, it's not the right time to wax lyrical. I think it's the time for writers, readers, students, teachers, all of us to um, use words, use words as what they are, which is that they are weapons full of meaning, full of riches, and 
this is how we look at the truth. This is how we search for the truth. So what am I saying about multiplicity? Whether it is as a writer or as a citizen, I am talking about the importance of acknowledging and living diversity. Because the homogeneous story invariably leads to the exclusion of people. It invariably leads to censorship. It invariably leads to what the poet Seamus Heaney called the government of the town. And today, that is where we are in our country. So even though we might write, writers write about the stuff of daily life, you know, we write about people and their lives and their fears and what they dream about and uh, both literally and metaphorically. Um, but the ideas there, the worldview that you are searching for through your books, through the questions your books pose, is a complex, diverse, multiplicitous, multiplicitous, I'm sorry, I'm so tired that <laughs> polysyllables are tripping me up. So this is, this is the narrative I want to talk about. And I'm glad you said that we all have multiple identities. We do. But all of us have to remember that we are living through times when the danger of a single story, the danger of a single story, whether it is what this completely bewildering, rich, variegated country can be reduced to if you want to exclude people, if you want to exclude ideas, if you want to sully the freedom of speech and the freedom to dissent. I think I'll begin there and wait for your specific questions. I agree with you, Gita. A writer always has a dream. A writer is something of an idealist and well, there are so many, there are goals that we strive towards, but then there are always hindrances in our path. Let me focus on your work and ask you, Gita, if you can tell us about the major milestones in your life, which shaped you as a writer, which influenced you. So let's come back to the personal. <laughs> um... I know it's very difficult for, for writers to emphasize the fact that um, it, is, it is the work. And um, I have never been the kind of writer who uh, is terribly enthusiastic about um, you know, sharing details of my life because I don't know what, uh, what great value there is there. Um, but uh, I grew up, uh, sort of uh, knowing I would always do something with words. My father was a journalist. He was the founder editor of the Economic Times. Um, and I knew that I would do something with words, of course, so ignorant to know what I would do with them. Uh, and like many uh, young people did in our generation, as a young college student, I wrote what I imagined was poetry. Um, I'm quite sure my poet friends will have a bit of a laugh at um, that. And Nisi um, Mezikil, who was a friend when I was a very young woman, I, um, uh, he wasn't a friend to begin with. I just went there and gave him with all the confidence you have as a young person, some of what uh, I thought was poetry and um, asked him to read them. And he said very kindly, this is what is called juvenilia. And then he said, do you know what, what the word means? <laughs> Of course, I was quite um, annoyed then, but he was wonderful because he read all my first my first book review, my first short story, and uh, he would send me these little yellow postcards saying persist, persist, and that's really what I did. Um, uh, there's some people in the, uh, in the present who are very lucky; they seem to be able to write when they're uh, disgracefully young and get published when they're even more disgracefully young. But uh, we were slow, I was slow. I um, did a lot of apprentice work, which I didn't impose on the world. Uh, it was also what happened to women of middle-class women of my generation. If you were not doing the things your family and you know your beloved parents expected you to do, 
then you had to support yourself. You know, you could hardly ask them to underwrite your rebellion. So I needed a job. And then later when I had my children, I needed to earn so I could pay their school fees and so on. So I, um, it was even more postponed, let me say, the writing. So I'm just trying to say that it was a very long period of apprenticeship. And in fact, the women in the audience, uh, the, uh, among our viewers will be happy to hear that it was when I was, when I went away on maternity leave the first time. Um, and it was so terribly boring uh, that, and I, uh, that I began writing The Thousand Faces of Night and um, then became a, a out of the closet writer. <laughs> so I think the only other literary milestone I can talk of is, of course, reading and writing are like inhaling and exhaling. So a lifetime of reading. Um, and that's important because when you're writing, who are you writing to? You're writing to many of the writers you admire uh, and imagine them as your readers, even if you've never set eyes on them, even if they're long dead. Um, so that is there. But I think I began with three novels which looked at the power of story and the power of storytelling. And what does the tale do when I tell you a story and you uh, pass it on, what happens? How does the story change, mutate? Uh, how does it change you, you know, and so on. Then I think uh, when I began writing in times of siege, actually finally became bolder. I think I left, um, I decided that I would look at the very dubious magic of day-to-day -day life of political life. It's not that my earlier novels were not political because they were looking at structures of power, but in a covert elliptical way. But from in times of siege, um, you know, and the attack on history, the attack on independent thought, the attack on the university space, um, I really began writing what I think of as the collective autobiography, the story of our present lives. So that was in times of siege and then uh, fugitive histories, which has as its at its heart what happened in Gujarat in uh, 2002. Um, you understand that it's not about these, but fugitive histories, for example, so many of us who are either not Muslim or who do not live in Gujarat, why is it that we were so shattered? Why is it we were involved? Why did we feel solidarity? then and we continue to for a number of uh, events and causes today. And I have a, a couplet that repeats itself through the novel. How did other people's stories get into my head? How did other people's stories become mine? And I think that is a, a writerly way of saying that it's solidarity that connects us to each other, that rules us. Because, you know, if you are going to live only with your own kind, life is not worth living. So that is what Fugitive uh, Histories was. And I have become the tide, which is sort of, you know, the third in that uh, trilogy. It really, I think anybody who reads it, either the novel or anybody who reads the news, today, the independent media's news, will know that it is talking to our time, talking to the old fault lines, the horrors of caste, but also the new manifestations, as well as the suppression of dissent. Yes, you are very right, Gita. Uh, talking about your in times of siege is uh, was that the time when you broke your leg and you decided to bring in your experience of the broken leg into the book? When you talked about all the scratches that you had because your leg felt itchy? You know, um, you never know uh, yourself what little autobiographical details go into it. Yes, when it comes to breaking bones, I am a rather experienced person. Um, I have to say that when I... Uh, went to the US for the release of Almost Home, I broke both legs then. Um, so that was even better than in times of siege. 
library for those who are listening and who do not know what we are talking about there are a couple of pages on different scratches uh, you know when you break your leg then you have your leg in plaster and then the as the leg is healing then the leg starts feeling itchy so you need to scratch it but then what do you scratch it with because uh, it's all covered the leg is covered in plaster so in that uh, in that book there is a girl who has a leg in plaster and she looks for different scratches with which to scratch her leg so there is a ruler there is a pencil there is a feather with a long uh, stem at the end there is a stick and there are all sorts of things with which the uh, protagonist uh, uh, scratches her leg her injured and you i must add that the uh, when you say the girl she is quite a uh, uh, what shall i say a storehouse of power and yes. might have broken leg and might be uh, yes. tortured with wanting to scratch it but she also wants to leave her mark if i can carry the That's the right. forward on um, what is happening to her guardian who has been victimized for a history lesson is written That's right That's so right. she's talking about uh, uh, she's actually uh, implicit implicitly leading us to ask questions about what should a university space be like the what is it there for? union the students union that she is heading and the students that she gets together you know, so that so that the professor who is her guardian uh, can be doesn't have to face any unpleasant situations i remember that yes and but it's not, point, yeah i'm sorry to interrupt but it's not just politics in the narrow sense of a union and so on those are just uh, you know useful little structures uh, she's actually asking a much bigger question which you and i uh, would be interested in which is that if you are in a space of learning um and this is important to us because when we're reading or writing we're also in a space of learning like we are in our own private universities but in a university what are you there for um you are there to speculate to imagine and debate because if you don't have doubt and difference and discussion in in a university uh, no learning is happening because it's all been written and all you have to do is memorize it by rote mm -hmm. because there's some you know god of information who's feeding you so i think that's that's the the real itch in the novel <laughs> yes geeta and i find that uh, there is a similarity in your concerns right from that book coming down to the present one that i have become the tide but uh, when you look back at your earliest work say when you look back to a thousand faces of the night what do you think of the book now would you have written it in a different way if you had to write it now of course uh, you know the only constant they say the cliche goes is change of course i mean that's like something my younger sister wrote but you know a younger sister i feel quite kindly towards um not terribly embarrassed by her but uh it, it, thousand faces of night uh, for many of us uh, and certainly for me the entry point into looking at structures of power what in our days you we used to call uh, being politicized was through the women's movement um so i think uh, very early um we realized that our brothers or you know male cousins or men at large were expected uh, to do much less than us whether it was at home and we had many more rules you know um so then uh, as i said i began writing the thousand faces of night when i was uh, on maternity leave and i was surrounded by these women you know all giving me wonderful contradictory advice about what i should do with the baby and you know uh, feeding and this and that and they were also talking to each other freely it was an kind of amazing powerful uh, women's version of the of locker room conversation except this locker room conversation was not objectifying anybody else they were actually talking about uh, the the uh, intimate connection between themselves as you know their identity and their bodies for example because there's nothing other than you know childbearing which makes you um identify with your body whether you like it or not now at that point uh you realized what a range of women's 
stories of oppression, but also subversion there was. There was always the story of resistance as well. And um, there, there was so much reference to the myths that I, this actually gave me a kind of voice that let's look at the, um, the prescriptive myths, the tales in the myths, and what were the subversive ones? You know, the women who, um, whether it was Amba or Surpanaka or, you know, who, who expressed themselves, who even changed sex and aspired to a certain kind of power and so on. So that's, that's how the Thousand Faces of Night. Uh, I must add though, Manju, in all honesty, that writers don't work it out like this, like a seminar. Mm -hmm. You write. It flows write, like a river. Your early work is spontaneous. And later, as you're thinking about it, as you're thinking of your writer's agenda for the rest of your life, you know, you come up with it. And it's mostly when other people ask. And if you, you can't be a, a, a real writer if you can't make up a good answer. <laughs> You're right, Gita. Uh, when I read your novels, I find that it has a certain impact on me. It is a very calming impact. And they go very slowly. You have to take each line. You, know, you have to take your time with each line. And you can't do it in a hurry. You have to enjoy, you have to savor every word, every line. And then what hits you is what Wordsworth has called the still sad music of humanity. The still sad music of humanity. And sometimes I find myself wondering, is Gita inspired by the other side of life? You know, the carnivalesque, the riotous, the joyous, the happy face of life. What do you say to that, Gita? Well, I think there is a lot of play in the language. I think there's there's a little bit of uh, fun, uh, as all serious things must have uh, some fun. But, you know, I don't, uh, I mean, Wordsworth and so on, uh, uh, I find a bit uh, depressing to think in terms of my school days or something. Um, and it sort of brings to mind very boring classes where they would go on about lyrical ballads. I'm so sorry, I hope I'm not corrupting your students. Um, really what I want um, readers, if I, could, if I could ask them to, to take away something from the work is to share with me the questions I have that have led me to write that. I haven't written any of it because I have the answers. If I had the answers, I would demand to be on what we used to call the planning commission and it's now some other sort of body. But um, so I want my readers, I want younger people, there are always younger people in my books because it's their future we are looking at, you know, I'm old, perhaps not you. But um, so, <laughs> so I want them to share those questions and look at the possibilities I suggest. And as they read, they will consider some possibilities. So I've always said that if there is one quick and pithy and efficient way I can describe my work and my writing life, it's a punctuation mark. It's the question mark. And that is what I want to work at. That is all I'm equipped to do. That is what the reader should do. That is what students should do. And more than ever, in these times when dissent is being crushed, that is what all our fellow citizens inspire us to do. From our farmers to our old grandmothers to our students. With that, Gita, should we come to the latest book that you brought out? I have become the tide. Would you like to tell us about it? Well, you know what I'm going to do? I don't know how much time we have, Manju. We have we have about 15 minutes more. Yeah, because I, for reasons uh, you know, if you look up the news, um, I am rather tired. It's been, uh, uh, in fact, in 15 minutes, it'll be exactly 100 hours. Um, so uh, I, what I want to do is quickly say that I've become the tide has uh, three, um, again, multiplicitous, interwoven um, uh, narratives. One is talking about somewhere around 
anything between 9th to 12th centuries, the uh, son of a cattle skinner who um, finds um, uh, a movement uh, which wants to bring people together regardless of um, gender, caste, and so on. And as we know, our history is full of those uh, movements which died out, but they were there and they will always be there to inspire us. The various Bhakti movements, for example. Uh, so that story is interwoven with the present and how many things we now have a constitution that guarantees us equality. We now have laws which say caste inequality, caste discrimination, caste atrocity is against the law. But how much has changed? You only have to look about you to read new horrors. So that is two, and I have three young students who are students. So that much has changed. But what is not? You know, does the institution accept them? Do society, does society accept them? So I have three students who are trying to get into medical college. Only one of them does. And then what happens to him there? So uh, in between to bridge these is uh, because how do I put myself? You know, I can't, as a writer, I can't only be writing about myself. I can't write only about this little world from which I come you know, of, of, of a certain caste and class of, of power. But that's what being a writer means. I have to try and understand. I have to express solidarity, the word I began with. So that is the story. But usually I love to read something from the um, poet, the Dalit poet from all those centuries back. But today there is no time to go back to the past. Today, we should remain in the present. So I am going to, if I may, read only the last, read a couple of paragraphs from the very last chapter for an important reason. Because while we are submerged in division, in hate mongering, in misery, in poverty, discrimination, we have love, we have play, we have language, we have literature, the arts, music, but we also have wonderful stories of resistance personified in those who resist, which is why I want to read not from the problems, but from resistance. The people ahead are moving. The rally has begun. The banners have been stretched out. The placards go up high enough to be seen and read. And the slogans, how many there are, how they mingle words and languages. Then a long one voiced call fills the air. The reply is many voiced. It's like a song Satya's mother and her friends may have once sung in the fields. The rally is moving slowly. People are crying themselves hoarse. They fill up the road. From where Asha walks, she can hear one wave shouting, La Salam. The wave that meets this one roars, Jai Bheen. Asha walks between the waves as if her thin dark body, her voice can make a bridge. Every time she responds to a slogan, Asha feels her chest tighten. She means what she says. She means it so much, she has to shout it out. The people's voice, Senthil called it. Senthil's voice, Ravi's voice, Ravi's drum that beats like a powerful heart. The voice Asha hears coming out of her mouth. Together they may make up a song with many verses, with or without rhyme. And the refrain, it must boom its way into the air, into Ravi's airless home and Satya's mother's lost field and Asha's father's government office. It must roll like a tsunami, find its way to the classroom and court and parliament and Satya's grave. The refrain is the one part of the song that must be sung together. The sun shines so hard, it could be the most powerful slogan shouter in the crowd. The road ahead of them is lustrous as water. The sweat pours down Asha's back. Her kurta is stuck to her skin. Ravi's face is wet, but he's hammering his drum. 
stopping only to wipe the sweat off his hands. Then an unexpected breeze arrives, turns into wind. It amplifies the people's slogans. The wind blows, teaching everything, every scrap of junk, every person there what it is to move, to refuse to stay in the same old tight-fitting place. The slogans get louder and the drums beat harder. In this blur of faces, words, and voices, Asha can almost believe that this crowd is not alone. There are other crowds in places across the country. There's strong currents flowing down roads and fields through villages and towns and cities. The crowd mills around Ravi and Asha. Ravi's drum has finally gone silent. She takes Ravi's hand. The red and blue flags, the words, the voices, the people. Is it only today? Or has this river of living bodies been flowing for a thousand years? The river rises. It fills Asha with anger and grief, but also a strange joy. She can hear Satya tell her, or maybe it's she who's telling Satya and Ravi, even the dead Professor Krishna and Chikaya. I have become the tide. Thank you so much. And I invite all of you to join me, to teach me how to become the tide. I have to leave now. Thank you.